All righty. Well, good to be with you again. I don't know about you, but now we've lost an hour. We've just had lots of food. So if I fall asleep, just wake me up, okay? Um, I don't know how many of you are NBA fans, basketball fans, but uh, there is, I don't know if you've ever heard of the player Kyrie Irving. And uh, he's well known, um, and he is a very polarizing sort of figure in the NBA. Uh, some people really like him, other people, uh, especially in the media, really don't like him. Uh, it's been reported that he's had like very fractious uh, relationships with like three different teams. The, he's on the, the Cavaliers with LeBron James, then he's like, I'm going over to the Celtics. This will be my new home. And then he like just leaves the Celtics and he goes to the Brooklyn Nets and like, this will be my new home. Uh, and then he says like, uh, actually I want to leave again. And he just recently got traded to the Mavericks, Dallas Mavericks. And so when he gets there in his opening press conference, he says like, you know, I just want to be in a place where I am celebrated. <laughs> and I don't know the guy, like, and maybe he, you know, he said, just said the wrong words, but to me, it just seems a little bit like, didn't say appreciated, he said celebrated. <laughs> it's like, I want everyone to just like say yay me, which this guy, it appears that he's got like all kinds of uh, like, relationship problems and just like blowing up stuff because it doesn't go his way. So it's just like, seems a little out of touch. I, I don't know, maybe I'm, it's not, the media is twisting it for me, but it seems kind of just like, uh, I don't know, buddy. I don't know if we should be celebrating, uh, celebrating you. And when we look at somebody like that, uh, and again, I don't, I don't know the guy, so maybe I'm completely off. But when we hear someone talk like that, we go like, uh, uh, Seems pretty egotistical, seems kind of narcissistic. Um, no way. And sometimes when we read scripture and we look at scripture and what it says and commands us to praise the Lord, we can have the same sort of perspective of like, is God just acting like a narcissist? Like, if we're, maybe we wouldn't come out right and say that because it almost seems like heretical to, to, to even suggest such a thing. But we go like, like, why are you telling me to praise you? Like, I, and I think this has kind of, a, there's a, a nagging question in the back of our mind a little bit of like, why should I praise the Lord? And what does it even mean to praise the Lord? Like, why is God, why does God need my praise? And what do, what do I do with that? Um, it, yeah, it just seems like God's just kind of this like, yes, a little louder, please. I would really, yeah, that, oh, that was good. Oh, keep it up, keep it up. Like, and, and, but I think this is the wrong perspective um, about who the Lord is. And this relates to the passage that we're going to look at this afternoon, Psalm 146. And if you like there, like to turn with me to Psalm 146. We talked in the morning about the three basic types of psalms in the book of Psalms of the Psalter. We had praise, thanksgiving, and lament. Praise, and these are again based on their basic structure. They all have a very typical format, structure that they, that they exhibit. Praise psalms are uh, praising the Lord because of God's character. Thanksgiving psalms, because, thanking the Lord for something specific that he has done. And then lament psalms, again, are crying out to the Lord in times of trouble. So here we have a praise psalm. And um, as we see, we'll see that it begins with this very explicit command to praise the Lord. Um, maybe before we jump, before we get into, too far into it, why don't we just read um, the passage together and then we can look at uh, how these praise psalms function a little bit as we look at the text. So notice here in Psalm 146, I'm reading from the ESV, starting in verse 1. It says, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. 
Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the way of the widows and the, and the, so, and the fatherless. But the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations, praise the Lord. So you see here, as it begins, you have this command to praise. And really, what we have is we have this praise psalm here and this command to praise the Lord because of God's creation, his care, and his rule of the world. And this is kind of broken up into three main, three main sections. We have this first section of the call to praise, verses 1 through 2. The, the, in the command, if you will, the call to praise. How many more C's can we think of here? Uh, of like, all right, we're going to praise the Lord now. Uh, you see that in verses 1 and 2. And then we see in verses 3 through 9, the cause for praise. Why would we, cause, uh, why would we praise the Lord? And that's, with all, psalm, with all praise psalms, you, you have this very typical format, this call for praise, which is, pretty general, and then much more specific about the character of the Lord in that cause for praise section in verses 3 through 9. And then it concludes in verse 10, uh, right where it began with this renewed call to praise in verse 10. So here, as it begins in verse 1, it says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. But again, we're back to this question of like, why would I praise the Lord? Like, what am I supposed to do with these types of, of psalms? And I think there's perhaps one way that we can approach this is, is this, is that, well, he's God, so you better praise him. He's worthy of praise, so we just have to. And I think in some respects that is right. He is God, and he is worthy of praise, and we should praise him. But I think that there's more to it than that because it still kind of leaves us in this vein of like, is God just needing of my praise? Is he just acting egotistically? And what is important for us to note here is that the Lord needs nothing. He is completely self-sufficient. He don't need me. He don't need me and my relationship with me. He doesn't uh, need my praise. It's not just like he's going, yes, I need this. I need more and more of this. Or like, I need my coffee in the morning. Really needed my coffee this morning. Need that. Would not be here without it. Uh, you know, but like, he doesn't need anything. He is completely self-sufficient. So if he doesn't need anything, why again does he tell us to praise him? Um, and really, it has to do with praise is not for him. It is for us. The purpose of praise is to reshape our heart to him, to recognize who he is, what his true value is, and to ascribe that to him. It's not to give him something, it's to reform and transform us. So it's not about stoking his ego, his ego. it is about transforming our own heart. And so here, what the Lord knows, he knows about us as humans, is that we are praise people. We give praise. The question is not if we will praise the Lord, but the question is what we will praise or who, whom, there we go, whom we will praise. Which one is it? And so when he call, invites us and calls us to praise him, it is to set aside those other things in which we praise that take precedence over the Lord. And he says, fix your eyes on me, the one who will truly and totally satisfy. And so here, again, these praise psalms are for us, not for them. I like how one author, uh, Jason Biasi, he says this, human beings are praise-bearing creatures. We become what we love. 
The Psalms try to shape what we love away from ourselves alone and those close to us so that we love God and all God's creation. They try to turn us inside out. That's the purpose of these praise psalms. So it's not God being a narcissist. It's a, a, a gift, a, a loving gift to bring us into true reality, away from things that harm us, away from other things that will take us into uh, not a flourishing life. And so here, when he invites us, when he commands here in verse 1, and he gives this call to praise, it's to bring us to recognize who the Lord truly is. It reorients our hearts back to him. And so it begins here in verse 1. It's perhaps slightly obscured in the English when he says, verse 1, praise the Lord. And the idea here is not just, that we think because we live in the West and we're very individualistic, all about me, right? Me, myself, and I. And here, this first line begins with a communal element, that we should praise the Lord. That this is something that we can invite each other to do and support each other to do in praising the Lord. That it is not just I recognize who the Lord is, but that we as a community, as a church, recognize truly who the Lord is. So there is this communal element as well as this individual element. The individual is not obscured from this. So we have communal praise, and then, but then you also have a very centered praise here in this second line of verse 1. Praise the Lord, O my soul. The, like, are your, your inmost being, your whole self is the idea of, the, of this phrase here. Praise the Lord, O my soul. You ever just like, when you come to church or some other time, and like, it's time to praise, and you're saying the words, but you don't feel it at all? Of course we do, right? And so here, it reminds us that like our innermost heart, our innermost being of who we truly are, must be reoriented back to the Lord and yield to him. And again, we, we, I mentioned this this morning, that like praise is not just like joy, this exuberance before the Lord of uh, getting excited before God. It, is, it can be that, but it can also just be recognizing who he is even in times of trouble, even in times uh, of not joy. And then also in verse 2, we see this committed praise. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. This is like his whole attitude, his whole orientation of his life is geared towards praise. Again, I think sometimes we think of praise as like when we come together and when we sing. We, we Reduce it down to that one sort of element. But here it is the whole life, how we live our lives. When you're at, the, at uh, your job, when you're going to school, when you're doing just the, the mundane, doing the dishes, uh, doing the laundry. Like, not that we're like, I'm praising the Lord right now and I'm singing this praise song as I'm doing my job. Like, just in those very acts of doing it for his glory is praise to him. Our whole selves uh, is geared toward him. So he invites us and calls us to praise the Lord here in verses 1 through 2. But then he's going to talk about in verses 3 and 4, uh, excuse me, verses 3 through 9 of this cause for praise. Again, why would we praise the Lord? What about his character, his identity, his attributes that would invite us to praise him? And that's what we're going to have here. And this is the majority of the psalm, verses 3 through 9. And it begins in a very negative way in verses 3 and 4. He's going to present a contrast for us, right? If you're, going to know, if you're going to understand who the Lord is and how wonderful he is and why he is so worthy of, your, of our praise, it is important to highlight the, the fact that of the things that we turn to towards praise that are not satisfactory. So he says here in verse 3, Put not your trust in princes. In a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. And so here, he's writing to the, the psalmist. We're, we're unsure, scholars are unsure exactly of when this psalm is written. But most likely, based on some, um, in, some linguistic um, indicators, it seems as if this is probably a later psalm. 
probably during the exile or maybe directly after the exile when Israel had been, uh, Israel and Judah had been defeated by the Babylonians and then taken back and then some are brought back to the land of Judah. And so they are in this time of turmoil where they are under oppression, where they are leaderless and they are um, not able to function as their own independent nation. And so they are perhaps going through this period of time of like, What's going to bring flourishing? Our, our nation is uh, under severe oppression, is in steep decline, uh, and it's been totally destroyed. We've seen our families uh, just been uh, decimated. And now how and where will we find flourishing? What will bring this nation back? Is what many Jews were thinking during this time frame. And so some people perhaps were thinking, We'll find this leader, he will lead us, and he will bring us back to this place of prosperity. Maybe they're thinking the Persians will do this, or the Babylonians, or some other leader, or one of their own would do this. But he recognizes, the psalmist reminds us, that any human ruler will fail. Notice what he says, Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. He's not saying that human government is evil or bad, but it's our tendency to place our hope and our trust in human government to solve all of our problems. And he's pushing back against that. He says, what we do, at, what our tendency for them and our tendency as, as humans even today is to place our hope in some individual. And I think he has a specifically po political edge here. Now, I don't really like politics. I don't find it particularly appealing. And the Bible is not really interested in politics, but the Bible is political. And if you just, I'm from America, so I don't, maybe this is not your context, maybe things, I know things are slightly different in Canada. I know, I know America is just everything and, you know, <laughs> no. But it, it just like, I, I see this as, as a dramatic problem for America. And I think this is not unique to America, is that what we can do as Christians, and I think this is a massive trend, is that we place our hope in a political leader. If we vote this individual in, or this party in, or pass these laws, this will bring us flourishing. And there may be positives on either side. I have friends, I have a lot of friends. I think I have a lot of friends. <laughs> Maybe I don't. But I have friends that are on both sides of the aisle. And I see my friends on both sides of the aisle, right, Republican, left, uh, Democrat, just very different opinions, and they seem to be placing all of their hope in that party, in that leader, in this philosophy. And the scriptures want us to not place our hope in that ideology. Our allegiance is to Christ and Christ alone. So it is a reminder that we are at a point in, um, in Christianity, I think, where we are allowing our political idealism and our political beliefs to override and to circumvent our dedication to the Lord. Maybe this is a different situation than what you find here, but I think this is a danger that we have as believers in our world. And this is, a, this is not new. We've seen, we can see this throughout history of Christianity falling time and time again to the same trouble. We see the same sort of situation being pressed by the psalmist here. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth, and on that very day his plans perish. And he's not just speaking of, like, here, the, there's a political edge to it, but it, it also shows this tendency of our, just our hope to place our, our idea of hope and flourishing in any human, whether it's a political leader or it's that Mr. or Mrs. Person, wonderful person, or our family. Like, where, like, we talked about this last night, like, where is our identity? Is it in, like, we can place so much hope and idea that our spouse or our boyfriend or girlfriend or our children, that's going to be the thing. If we just do this, this will bring flourishing. Our hope must be in the Lord and him alone. For those other things, human government is a gift. A spouse, children, those are gifts. Friendship, uh, uh, leaders in the church, those are gifts. But they are not idols. And we have a tendency of our hearts. John Calvin says this, that our, our hearts 
are idol factories. And we have to be aware that our hearts are idol factories and recognize the, the tendency of our hearts to, to place too much onus on a human individual. And so when we do that, when we place all of our hope, not that we like just are super jaded and like, well, I'm going to listen to JC and I'm never going to trust anyone ever again. That's not what he's saying. It's not what the psalmist is saying. That's not what I'm trying to say. But the idea of, where, of placing our ultimate hope and trust in our relationships, it, it's only going to lead to despair. It will not bring flourishing in your life. It will not bring satisfaction in your life. Only Christ will truly satisfy. And so here he begins with this contrast of pressing against like, hey, it, it ain't that. Why should we praise the Lord? Because everything else does not bring satisfaction. But you know who does? Christ does. Notice what he, how he flips this. So he's, he's given the negative, now he's going to give the positive in verse 5. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord his God. And so here, you have this line, verse 5, and I think this is a very misunderstood line in verse 5, and we see this in several key points in Scripture. Blessed is he whose, hope, uh, whose help is the God of Jacob. What does this word blessed mean? It almost seems like if I place my help in God, if I place my hope in him, then I will get all kinds of great stuff. Why? So I'm going to be a good kid, and I'm going to obey, and then I will be, get all this good stuff, all kinds of blessing. And that's not what this is talking about. It's super easy to understand it that way, but that's not what he means. I think part of the, part of the problem is how this word works in, in English. Because in, in the original, it, it's, it's quite distinct. So just allow me to be nerdy for like two minutes. Can you allow me to be... Uh, Maybe I'm just nerdy all the time, sorry. But let me be extra nerdy for like two minutes. Is that in the original here, there's two different words that are used. One is to bestow blessing on someone by a superior. Typically, God blesses an individual or the priest will bless an individual, bestow something on someone. That's one word. It's not this word. This word is a different word. And this is a word that is viewing this uh, um, experience from someone of equal status. So I am looking at, me, me and you, we're looking at this thing. And it's almost as if like we're putting our arms around each other and like, look at this. That's where true flourishing is found. And it's an invitation into that way of life. It's not a moment of gain, of look at this and see where we can find this gain of what we can get out of this. It is, this is the way, the path of life that leads to true flourishing. Uh, other translations may put this, happy is he whose help is the God of Jacob. And, and like that kind of works to some extent, but it's also not talking about the emotion of happiness. Like, I'm happy. My house just burned down, but I'm happy. <laughs> eh, no, and we just look at lament psalms. Like lament is the total, total thing, right? And that's totally fine to lament. It, we are encouraged to lament, right? So he's not just talking about happy, but this idea of where true flourishing is found. And so here, blessed flourishing is he whose help is the God of Jacob. This is the same word that's used in Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, but who delights in the law of the Lord. This is the same word that's used in Greek um, in the New Testament um, when, in the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That's the same sort of concept that's being used here. Not of this like, if I do this, I will get this. But this is a life that leads to flourishing. And so here he says, flourishing is he, is the person, he or she, whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. And so in this, he also is recognizing like the historical actions of God with Israel that he has done throughout history, of how he has redeemed them out of Egypt, of how he has been consistently their God, how he has rescued them, how he has blessed them, all of that. He reckon, he, he's calling to mind the acts of faithfulness that God has already done. He says, flourishing are the, is those who place their hope in a God who has already proved himself. You ever trusted someone, but then they prove not to be super trustworthy? 
That's not who the Lord is. He has proved himself time and time and time again that he is trustworthy. So to place your hope in him, that's where true flourishing is. And then he talks about, okay, this is the type of things that he done. What type of things, what type of power does he have? Who made heaven and earth, verse 6, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever. Uh, and so here you have like these two views of God. And I think sometimes we, we go too hard on one side or the other. We view God as like, okay, he's powerful. He's all powerful. He created the world. That's some serious power. And right? he just like, you know, hmm, let's have some light today. Let there be light. Like he just speaks and it happens, right? Like, you know, giraffes would be cool today. Let's have some giraffes. Boing! Like that's crazy, right? So he has serious power, but like we maybe recognize that God has power, but then we wonder, like, does he actually care about me? Does he actually love me? Is he actually going to do good? Or on the other side, we may have this view of God that he does care about me, he does love me, he will be faithful, but is he powerful enough, powerful enough to even do anything for me? And so here, the psalmist is, is, is saying he's both. He is all-powerful, and he is all love. So notice that he says, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. And then notice how he concludes that line of verse 6, who keeps faith forever. He's not just like this super mighty God, and he just tramples everybody, although he is that. But he is a faithful God who keeps faith forever. And then in verses 7 through 9, the first part of 9, um, 9a, He's going to describe further of how God is faithful. And he's going to create this picture about God as the great king. In the ancient, uh, in the ancient Near East, the ancient Middle East, there's, uh, you see this in many texts from the ancient Middle East from the same sort of time period, of the type of um, descriptions about what made the most ideal king. What sort of qualities would the best king have? And they would have just like these, like, like a bullet point. Here's, here's all these things that uh, what we would consider a good king to be, these things. And what we see in verses 7 through 9, that the Old Testament, this passage here, the author, is utilizing that list to highlight that God is that good and right king. Like everything that you think is the greatest about a leader, that's who God is. And this, again, it goes back and presses against what we saw in verses 3 and 4 of this political edge that it has. It's like, it's not those other leaders. It's not Hammurabi. He ain't that good leader. You maybe think that he's the, great, he's the great lawgiver. No, God is the good lawgiver. He is the good king. And so it's notice of the descriptions that are described about God here in verses 7 through 9. Who executes justice for the oppressed. Notice of it kind of creates this like rhythm in the text. Who executes justice for the oppressed. Who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. Notice it's just like that like drumbeat of the passage. And it's very intentional. It's like the same construction over and over again to like get you into this rhythm. And just notice of like the care and concern that God has for those who are oppressed, for those that are needy, who executes justice for the oppressed, right? That's the idea of a good king would do justice, that they could come, that an individual could come to the king and plead for justice and he would give it. That's what the Lord does. The Lord is a God of justice. When he looks at are at the crime, he looks at the suffering, he looks at the abuse, he looks at all of the evil in this world, he will do justice. He will not allow that sin to go unpunished. And this is the, like the only thing that like gives me hope when I look at just like this broken world and I read the news and it's just so depressing, another war, another abuse scandal, or another whatever, is that the Lord will, knows of it and will judge it. He will come and he will do justice. Our God is concerned about justice. He will not let it hide. He cannot get away with it. He is concerned about justice. He is concerned about those who are oppressed by the injustice. He gives food to the hungry. 
He sets the prisoners free. I mean, if someone in the ancient world uh, could go to prison for the smallest sort of infraction. And he is concerned, uh, and to, to be in prison was like a, a horrific experience. Like, I, I'm sure it's a terrible experience to be in prison today. Like, I'm not trying to undermine this. But in ancient prisons were far worse. Like, they didn't have TVs, didn't have gyms, far worse. Like, you had needed family members to come bring you food, and if you didn't, you were going to starve to death or get, like, some disease and die. It was absolutely terrible. And the Lord is concerned with those people, with those who are the destitute, with those that are the oppressed. He says this, the Lord opens the eyes of the blind. He loves to minister even to our physical uh, problems that we have. And I, this is the thing, like, the Lord doesn't just always heal our, our physical problems, but the Lord, that is not his idea, ideal uh, for this world and for our lives. And this is part of what Jesus does. Like, when, when Jesus comes to this earth, part of his uh, mission is to bring healing to the world. Notice, you don't have to turn there, but in, in Matthew chapter 9, like when Jesus does miracles, he's not just going like, all right, how can I show everyone that I'm a Messiah? Zap, 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 you're all healed. Bring in the next lot. Zap, zap, zap. Like, all right, you prove, does that prove it to you? You guys get it? I'm the Messiah now, right? It is out of genuine concern and extending the, his kingdom right then and there. It's a small taste of his kingdom and the flourishing that it will provide. And so you see this in, in Matthew chapter 9 at the end, when you have two whole chapters of Jesus just healing all sorts of individuals. And Matthew has intentionally tried to place these stories all next to each other so that it creates this like, a cacophony of miracles that Jesus does, and it's uh, summarized in chapter 10, verse 35. Jesus went out throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he is, we read that passage from 1 Peter this morning, right? He is the shepherd and overseer of our souls. He looks at us and doesn't go like, oh, get your act together. He looks at us like, I will put your act together. That's who our Lord is. That's the type of God that we have. He is concerned with all aspects. That he wants to bring flourishing in our eyes. So as we turn back to Psalm 146, he sets the, the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the, of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. Perhaps he's speaking here of a physical malady, of someone who is physically bowed down. But perhaps he's also speaking emotionally of, or mentally being bowed down, of, of just being perhaps depressed. That he would lift us up. He says further, the Lord loves the righteous. To live for the Lord, to live a righteous life as God desires us to have, is a difficult thing. Throughout all of history, I think sometimes we say, like, the world's worse today. And maybe it is. I don't know. But this has been all throughout history. It is pushing against the world to live for the Lord. And so here is a reminder that when we are living for the Lord, when you're seeking to live that righteous life and live for the Lord, the Lord loves that. The Lord loves the righteous. He doesn't go like, yeah, of course that's what you should be doing. Duh. Good job. You want a participation award? That's not what the Lord is, right? Here's a trophy. Way to go. That's not how the Lord is. He looks at that as like, yes, I love that you're seeking to live for me. I love that you're doing what I desire. God shows his favor to those who orient their hearts to him. And that's a reminder that as we are living in a world where no, like, few people are going to love you living your life according to the God's word, it's a reminder that God does love it. And then he says further, just notice how this is like continually building. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners, those that are, have no rights, those that uh, don't have uh, an ability to protect themselves. The Lord watches over them. 
So you have this just like this drumbeat, this rhythm of all the characteristics of God as this good king. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord. And then it all slams to a screeching halt in the middle of verse 9. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. The author has intentionally tapped the brakes, really hit hard the brakes here, because he wants you to slow down. He's changed the construction. Notice how it's the Lord, 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 but he really wants you to just hit home on this line right here. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. And this is the, the highest point, or maybe even the lowest point, of the uh, what was considered of the most destitute, the most disadvantaged, the most oppressed type of, of individuals within the ancient world were widows and orphans. Because the, 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 he's writing to a group of people that are living in a patriarchal society where your entire identity is defined by a male, a man. And so if your husband dies, and there are exceptions to this, but if your husband dies, you are most likely, as a woman, going to be in, not just like in an economic problem or, in a, or a, a, a tragic event, but you are on the edge of starvation now. And the same for a child who is orphaned. Like, there's no orphanages in the ancient world. And so God's heart is for those who are most marginalized, who are most oppressed, who are most destitute. His heart is for them. And he, he shows this, that he desires to uphold them. He upholds the widow and the fatherless. And this is, what, this is why, when we look at the book of James, James talks about like the high point of what true religion looks like is to take care of widows and orphans because they will give you nothing back. They're not able to. And so here you have the Lord. His great concern is of the most destitute, the most despised, the most marginalized. And then he says this, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. Those that resist him, that go against him, he will bring justice. And so here we have just this God of goodness, this God of mercy, this God who shows tenderness and care, but also justice. And here the psalmist is trying to emphasize, here's why you should praise the Lord. Reorient, look at who God is, the care that he gives, and put your hope in him. Rest in him. And then he concludes here in this final, this final verse, in verse 10, the Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations, praise the Lord. And so here he closes this line with this renewed call to praise. Praise the Lord here. Why? He will reign forever. It's not going to be for four years. Not going to be until they call the next election. It's not going to be until like, well, it just kind of burned out. We'll try something else. Forever. And he is, as we looked at earlier, he is faithful. And this is why he invites us to praise the Lord, to ascribe him honor, glory, value. And in that, have our hearts transformed to we rest in him. The praise is not for him. It's for us to bring us back to him. And so here we have just, I think, a beautiful, beautiful look at the heart of the Lord. And it challenges us to not forget who he truly is and to rest in his power, in his love, and his care, and his rule of the earth. When we close with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you that you care so deeply for us. We thank you that you are a good God, a faithful God, a God of justice, and a God of mercy. Father, we pray that you would help us to trust in you, that you would not rest in other things, things that will not satisfy. We thank you that you give us your flourishing. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to live for you, that we would rest in you. Transform our hearts, Lord, to praise you. Father, we thank you that you are not a greedy God, a God who needs something, but you are a God who just loves to give. We love you with all of our hearts, Lord and bring us close to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen.